So we'll close that up, leave it soloed, and bring in the bass. And the first thing that I can tell you right now is that we're gonna duplicate this, we're gonna molt this bass track out three more times, or two more times. So I'm just gonna double it, and I'm gonna rename the tracks. This is a really standard setup for us where we have the bass track separated out into bass fuzz, bass mid, and bass sub. Yep. And then I have this pre-cut um, for our needs, but what we also do is suck out certain regions depending on where in the song we want the fuzz track to be added. Yeah, it's almost like hitting a distortion pedal. Yep. Um, we did that a lot on, on the We Car record that we just mix. Is there's a lot of sections that were very dreamy and they were very uh, quiet, and melodic, and so you don't you don't need like a ripping bass guitar going through that. And instead of automating a, a bass you know pedal or making him record it and stomp it in and make him do all that stuff. We just made a fuzz track or a, a distort track, whatever you want to call it, and you can do things like that where you can even do it where you have a distortion pedal and then say you want a little bit more distortion in the chorus. You, you do the same thing. It's just it's basically like manual automating that makes it super easy, very similar to when we do vocal delay throws where we just bring it down and it throws out. It's just convenience, and it's a nice visual representation of being like, okay, there... That's where the distortion is on the bass. I actually don't like that, so screw that. Okay, I love that. I kind of want to go longer, pull it over. It's For me, it's a very nice visual attachment to, to the song being mixed as it goes. So across those, um, and this is like the most preset y that our mixes get, is that on those three tracks, there's a standard bass stack that I'll load up that we start from. In this case, I went ahead and saved the Amir bass stack. Uh, bass stack, cool. And that is three amp sims. Let me look at these. I guess we can get rid of the drum for now. Uh, now we'll leave them in. Huh? Well, let's shore up everything but the drum bus itself. Oop. Cool. So we're looking at drums and bass. Um, we've got our auto automation group feeding our master group, and then we've got our um, fuzz mid bass subtracks. So listen to these individually. The fuzz track, um, and to, again, we start from like these pod farm starting points that are similar, where like this one is a really ratty sounding Powerball. Um, it's a very strange one for sure. Yeah, this one ends up being more of like your standard Ampeg style tone, clean bass. Um, it's a rock classic and an 810. And then the bass subtrack, um, I think is the 810 again. It's just a oh, no, no it's, it's just a sub with no the cab. Sub dub. So it's literally just like similar to having like just a trillion sub under it. Yep. And we um, comp the hell out of that. Yeah, so for me it was I always struggled with getting a bass tone that had the the low end I wanted with that notation. Like I think it's important that a bass guitar has uh, melody in it if possible like and that comes from the mid to the or the mid lows to the mid highs and that's the hardest part in my opinion, and then also I wanted the distortion to be exactly how I wanted it, and it's it was really tough for me to dial those in, so, you know, I, looking at plenty of other people that did this, that made the most sense to me, so it's almost like we multi-band EQ'd our bass into the high end is distortion, the mid-range is, like, for the notation and the melody, and then the sub is just low end, but they're all, I'm using different amps, to achieve all that, to have one good bass tone. So let's listen to the fuzz track on its own. It's got that like real dark glassy style rattiness, or maybe sans ampy. Just sounds kind of shitty. Sounds abrasive. Way. Yeah, it yeah. sounds angry. Our mid tone. into the specific pod farm settings more? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Um, so once we've got all this together in the bass phase, which, um, Great. And it's also because of Josh's hand. Yes. Like Josh's hand makes every instrument he's touched sound mad. So 
like I couldn't play that bass and make it sound like that. No. It comes from practicing your instrument. So, you know, sometimes if you want the right tone, you got to have the right person playing it. Yeah. In this one, the idea was just like create a fucked up sounding bass tone. This is based so, off of an HM2, yep. a Boss HM2, which was called a heavy metal pedal, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just a entombed and, classic Swedish. Yeah, and they tone. they stopped making them. But my favorite heavy band of all time is Converge. So that was the first time that I heard it, and that was the first time that I fell in love with it. If you they go on Craigslist for like sixty bucks to eighty bucks, and they are awesome. We actually have a real one in the studio just to mess with random stuff with. But um, we're just running that through like a. It's an a pretty old clean app. So if we turn off the pedal, it just sounds like the world is ending when that pedal's on. And if you do buy the real pedal, just turn every knob to ten, and you'll have <laughs> the only thing that that pedal does well is turning everything to ten. And then it sounds insane. And then you can see we're really notching where we're accepting like that kind of rattiness into the mix. Yeah, we don't really need above 9, 8K for in any information for the bass right now. So that's why I say this is, you know, compartmentalized to here. And this is all we want. This is all we're going to compress. This is all we're going to use. This is all we're going to let come through from this distortion. Yeah, like this low cut is probably not doing anything. <laughs> because we're EQing yeah. so much there. And then the compressor on it, a 76 on bass. I mean, can you go wrong? One thing that's worth noting here is that we're compressing the bass after we're distorting it. You're gonna get a very different quality of the saturation, um, the order of which you put those two, if you can imagine. Um, one is gonna basically accentuate the distortion with your pick attack, the other is gonna make the whole thing more staticky fuzzy. Uh, on this fuzz track, that's what we want, staticky fuzzy. Yeah. On the bass mid track, um, you'll notice we're already sucking off the subs here in the channel EQ, and then we're notching out some problem frequencies um, and some grossness around 3K. If we open that up, we've got our SVT classic head and an eight by 10 with a 47. Significant amount of gain coming from that. This head driven that hard probably wouldn't sound that great if it was your main tone, and that's why the low end gets sucked off, because the low end yep. is actually really square and blocky and gross. Yeah, both of these tones, we didn't want any of the problem areas, and that was the low end. You know, so that's why you basically get your tone, per se, and mm -hmm. then you just add a subtract to get the low end where you need it to be in relation to the kick drum, which he'll probably jump into when we get there. And then we know we've got some woofiness around the 800 region that we're sucking out here, so. And the top end just needs a little more. Yeah, what's so funny about, it's not funny, but what's great is that the bass and the guitar when you'll hear, that's just the first instance that we've touched that shows um, the marriage of the bass and the guitar. They get blurred on this record because it's just Josh playing everything. So the goal was to just make it sound like one power instrument. And that, that simple EQ adjustment, you would never do if you wanted separation between the guitar and bass. But here, we actually wanted that high end to marry with the guitar so that was a conscious choice for that lens to just make it sound like one thick like wall in your face. That's part of the balance actually is making like seemingly strange EQ choices knowing that it's going to basically fill the hole of something else and that was the bass to the guitar. Yeah, the bass is like our center guitar channel. Yeah. Um, on the sub low one, let's just look at this pod farm one. Can't tell anything if we've got the... Uh, low end cut that much. Really warms it up. I think maybe the REQ2 is doing it too. Oh yeah, REQ is definitely. Yeah. So let's disengage that and listen through. Yeah. So we're just sucking off like extreme frequencies there. We've got Compressor. Pretty aggressive. 10 dB at 8 to 1. We're locking this then in place. 
Yeah, and I I'm, I don't know if anybody's wondering why we're choosing like a UA1176 and then a CLA76, and I don't think there is any reason. I think it's just, I need 1176, and then it's just whichever one comes into our brain, brain quicker. Yeah, I don't have UAD plugins at home, so my default is the 76 and my CLA. Yeah, my default's the UA. So. Yeah, the only time we've ever made a conscious decision on one over the other is whenever we run out of UAD power. And we have to, yeah, we have slots, to use the ways, yeah. We'll kick the wave ones over. I really don't have a preference. One of them probably does sound better. But, yeah, I mean, what's interesting is they both have a black, they both have a blue, and then I think UA just released, like, an anniversary one and then yeah. a few others. It's like, I can't tell. I mean, I can kind of tell a difference, but not enough that would warrant choosing one over the other. They I both... can't tell a difference in, like, the process. Of, like, when I'm picking, I would never, like, I can't consciously say why I would choose one over yeah. the other. Yeah, they're both great. Like, in the heat of things, so to speak. In the heat of the moment? Yep. Shout out. Um, so yeah, uh, in our base bus now, we've got this REQ that's giving us a little more um, low pass, high pass. Let's find out what this thing does. Let's find out what Sonic Q does. <laughs> Top end. Yes. Yeah. So it's giving us rattiness in the top end and a little bit in the upper mid range, which makes sense. We're driving a little bit up top, a little bit of mids. It's basically just a boosting everything and then also attenuating the low end. Thank, so. It's kind of like a pull tech style. Thanks, Absolutely. Kyle. Yeah, that was a good find. Um, this one. It's, it's just like it's just like having like a, a little like bumper lanes on your pulling alley of like a base. It just like keeps you in line a bit. It's not doing too much. I've got this sucker. That does it. That's all our consistency like, yeah. on the floor. That, that was also a really hard thing for me early on was trying to find low end that was consistent and, and that, that plugin really helped me a lot. So if you don't use that plugin, I would definitely recommend messing with it. What is this limiter doing? This limiter is on there specifically because when the fuzz track gets added, it's a little bit chaotic. So it's just to keep it from uh, from going over that. Yeah. Can you show us the difference? Yeah. Like what you mean by chaotic? Oh yeah. So if if I move this, you'll notice the the fuzz region is in view. But there, it starts hitting a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Can you turn it off, off and on? Let's see this. It's yeah. more that I'm feeding it into another compressor, and I don't want so to worry leveling about it beforehand. what might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because okay. this sense. is the one where I'm ducking based on the kick. So if I solo the drums here. see this band move with no bass playing, and that's the kick drum. It's just feeding off the kick drum, it's ducking a little bit, um, and that really, really, really clears things up. So the last thing we've got on the bass bus um, is this little bit of notching again, a little more beach ball -y. Woofiness in here. Yeah. So I'm going back and cutting that out. Yeah. And that's our, our rhythm section. It sounds so weak without that fuzz track on this song particular. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting listening to how that one is a very vital part of the overall tone. Exactly. It's part of the guitar tone, really. Can you also covered the pod farm settings for the sub yeah. track? Oh, yeah. And, Sorry I didn't open that one. And um, turn on the automation for the bass auto, because that's a good one, too. Yeah. Yeah, so we kicked that one on. Um, do I have anything else automated on here? No. Mm -mm. Cool. Bass sub track. Sorry for not explaining that. Uh, Line 6 has this one amp called a sub drop. 
Sub dub. Sub dub, sorry. Wubba lub dub sub dub. Yeah. Um, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, this one just really rounds out top end, low end, and we don't have a cabinet on it. Yeah. Because so, we don't want any high, we don't want any um, articulation. Yeah. Oh, other thing worth mentioning is the base was tracked through our Avalon DI. In that, that was that was a great, great. Great tool. purchase. <laughs> so the Avalon DI, my friend Dan Corniff actually told me that uh, I think I think I, I don't remember if I was there for Motionless or if we were catching up. Anyways, uh, he said that the Avalon DI is basically like five DIs in one because there's a tone knob that it's far left means it's off. It doesn't do anything. And as you turn, if you get the guide or you can Google it, you can look at what they do. And so some of them are like pre-cutting. So I think two is the one that we usually use for bass because it's cutting um, a lot of the stuff that we would... 200, 300 range? Yeah, it's cutting a lot of that, that like woofiness that you don't want to have a bass guitar anyways, and it's kind of scooping it a bit, which is great. And then if you turn it over to five and six, it's actually high-passing the low end a bit, which is great for rhythm guitars. It's great for, uh, you know, synth sometimes if you just want it to be like a loud, like in-your-face lead. Um, so... The Avalon DI, I think I bought it used off of Craigslist for like 400 bucks, and it's 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 crazy how much it can shape your DI when it goes in. So this one, the base DI is on a, a Tone 2 of Avalon U5 is what it's called, and then all the guitars are tracked through Tone 6, which is um, the one of the ones for the guitars with the highest pass. Um, so that's a really instrumental tool actually that that we use all the time because we're always tracking DIs first and then reamping later whether it be this record motionless and white any anything that we've done it's it's going through that first and that really helps just give you a head start on the tones that you're after and again it's these incremental decisions that you're making that are going to add up yeah and it's not like they make or break it's just that they build 